Hey, how are you? I'm doing all right, thanks. All right. So for today's episode of the Kowalski House, I want to welcome my guest, Stephanie House. She is a mental health professional in a private practice, and she's a Kratom advocate. She's a human and animal rights activist and a mom of two girls. She's also a student working towards her PhD in mental health. So thank you for joining us and making time. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to chat. I felt like your story and, and your experience with, I feel like listeners will be very interested in that. Yeah, I think Kratom itself is just such a misunderstood substance. There's a lot of negative information out there and I come at it with a totally different perspective. Yeah, um, and I, I can't yeah. wait to hear. So you, you weren't someone that came from a background of addiction. How did you come no. across Kratom? You know, and that's such an interesting, because I never knew what Kratom was. I'd started using it a, a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago. Um, my struggles were more with uh, depression and anxiety, um, those types of issues. I had pretty chronic anxiety. I mean, I still have pretty chronic anxiety. I'm not here to say Kratom is the magic substance or anything, but um I was in a period of time where I was really struggling with a lot of uh, personal things. Uh, depression was almost daily. Um, anxiety and panic attacks actually was, was the big motivator to find a solution. Because um, I don't know if you've ever had like a real panic attack, but it's dehabilitating. Mm. Um, and I was, I was having them so often. Um, and my, my, my practice where I was working at the time, uh, it was next to a little it looked like a bar or a coffee shop and it said uh, on the window, like mood enhancing, elevating teas and cocktails. And I was like, Oh, what does that mean? So I walked in one day on my lunch break uh, and it was just, a very, it was like a cafe, but they brewed Kratom um, and they made it into like little juices. Like they mixed it with juices and sugars and, and they made them really tasty and I didn't know what it was. So I had asked, I guess it would be the bartender, you know, what's the deal? What is this all about? And he really gave me a solid education in, in probably 10 minutes about what Kratom is, how it's used, um, how it helps. And I remember that at that time I was kind of on the cusp of a panic attack, uh, had felt really anxious. You know, if you've had them so often, you know when they're coming on. Uh, and it really just stopped it in its tracks. And I find Kratom does that for me. Um, yeah, that's so awesome. That's, yeah, and I've been using it for that ever since. Yeah, so you said a couple things. One, one where you talked about the, uh, I guess, the anxiety or the, the panic attacks. And for me, I, I'm coming in from a little bit of a different place where I was – I did have addictions. I was addicted to a lot of things, namely alcohol, sex, and drugs. And sure. so I, when I stopped all those things, I actually stopped everything cold turkey for about six and a half years. I didn't have a drink. I didn't do any drugs. I smoked an occasional cigarette, but it was an emotional roller coaster for me. And I definitely went through lots of periods of depression and just white knuckled it. And if I wasn't so determined and so sure, like crystal clear about the, like, the call God had on my life and my purpose and all that, I would have easily gone back. So when I see people that are struggling with addiction and they go back, they continue to go back to that thing. And then I see something like Kratom, which really does take the edge off sometimes when you need it. Um, you know, I, I wonder to myself, why are people demonizing this thing? Because I've used it a lot over the last two years and it's, there's no addictive properties. Like I'll, you, I'll drink it one day and I can have it the next day or not have it. It's not like I'm scratch itching for it, but it's, there's no like, you know, maybe it's about as addictive as a cookie is the way I look at it. Like if I have a chocolate <laughs> chip cookie one day, I might want a chocolate chip cookie the second day, but it's, there's, there's nothing more beyond that. And, um, to me, it's just like, it, it could be, if people knew about it more, cause I don't feel like it's even that well known much less, uh, where can you even find it? You know, like, in, it's, there's not even, there's nothing in Baltimore, like a Kratom or a Kava bar. That's where I'm from mm -hmm. that serves this stuff. And I'm like, well, you know, with so many people dying off of opioids, overdosing homeless, you know, like men performing homosexual acts for heroin. I'm like, why isn't this being offered as a, a possible solution? It, it really blows my mind. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, I know that 
for me, my experience with it, as far as you were talking about withdrawals, it's, it's kind of said that withdrawals are property of Kratom. But for me, because Kratom is factually part of the coffee family, like not having Kratom is the equivalent of maybe not having a cup of coffee in the afternoon. You know what I mean? Like maybe yeah. I'll feel a little sleepy. Maybe I'll get kind of a headache. But that's the extent of my withdrawal. I don't, you know, totally. I mean, I'm not taken to my knees if I don't have it, you know, I mean, I might be tired. Yeah. But. I have a friend that's in recovery and he told me, he said, oh yeah, the uh, withdrawal when that is, is worse than heroin. And I'm like, dude, it's not. I use it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, no, you have to use it for 14 days straight before you get a, a, an addiction. So I, being the person that I am, I drank it for 14 days straight because I, <laughs> I wanted to see if, you know, he was right. And there was nothing. There was absolutely no addiction or withdrawal at all. So yeah. there's, again, there's, it is a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation mm -hmm. out there. And maybe if you were to use it in like really excessive amounts over long periods of time, maybe, I don't know, because I didn't do that. I used it just so like mildly. Mm -hmm. Um but I hadn't seen any, any real downside to it. It's not like you have a headache or anything the next day. It's, right. Not right. I totally agree with that. I, like I said, and, and factually it's just, it's just like, it's a, it's a psycho stimulant. So it's part of, I mean, it is, it's it re, your body reacts to it as it does coffee. Um, yeah. So when you're talking about withdrawals, I mean, and every body is different for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I have not known anybody to have any extreme withdrawals. I have not personally experienced that um yeah. so How i think that's just it? propaganda i i take capsules mm -hmm. most days in the afternoon mm -hmm. very mild dosage a very small dosage sure um because before i was super addicted to caffeine yeah. i was the kind of person who had those bang energy drinks in the morning and in the afternoon you know i just copious amounts of caffeine um but a small dose of Kratom in the afternoon really curbs that craving for, for like really high voltage energy. Um, totally. it keeps me, it keeps me on the middle road, which I love. Yeah. I, I actually use it sometimes just for, for like boredom. <laughs> like I, cause I, I'll be working <laughs> sure. like a 15 hour day and I'll be a, you know, 10 hours into it and I'm just like mm -hmm. done. I, I'm ready to go home. I'm like, I want to tap out and I'll put a pot of, and I'll just sip sure. on it and I'll crank out like five more hours of work. Yeah. And it's, I don't know what it is. It might be the energy or maybe mm -hmm. it's just because it's like giving myself something different, like a little reward or something. Sure. And, and, you know, to me, the way I look at it is like, cause I'll have, you know, specifically like, so I'm a Christian and you know, they like to put things in boxes like this is right this is wrong you know whatever and I, I'm like if it doesn't cause me to make bad decisions and, mm -hmm. and there's regret associated with it I, actually if anything it helps me become a better version of myself because I'm able to work longer on my goals so like what's the downside let's just not demonize it just to demonize it because that, that doesn't even make sense so yeah. what do you use it for exactly you use it for you use it for like anxiety for energy anything else yep so like you were saying, sometimes just to get a, like a, like a mood boost, you know, it's really great for that. And, um, I know there are time periods in my school where I have to write these really extensive papers. Um, instead of going to like a coffee shop to focus, like a lot of people do, I'll go to the Kratom bar. I'll bring my laptop there. I'll have a couple of, you know, Kratom teas that they blend for me and I'll just crank out my paper there, you know, and it's really great for focus. Um, I do have a little bit extra when I feel those panic attacks coming on, when I feel very anxious um, and I'll just nip it right there with, with a cup of Kratom or a couple of capsules. Um, yeah. So, awesome. I'm, you know, and it, it helps. It really does help. And does it take away all of my issues? No, because the underlying thing making me anxious is still there. I'm not going to call it a miracle, right. but if I don't have to suffer, you know, in those debilitating like heart palpitations, the sweating, the, the stress, like the sure. excessive stress, then I'm not going to, yeah. you know, and that's yeah, and I, ultimately why I use it. Yeah. And I think, I think what we're, what you're saying is nothing was, nothing is better. And I agree with that. Like, it's probably better just to do nothing. The thing is, is though people don't do nothing. They do Suboxone, they do methadone or they run back to alcohol or drugs mm -hmm. when they can't handle the pressure of life, which again is if you look at the success rates of like NA and AA, they're like single digit percentage, like of people that actually are successful. 
because they can't manage the lifestyle. They can't manage being completely clean. So mm -hmm. versus giving them a little bit of freedom and say, okay, well, these things are legal. They're not really harmful. So maybe giving them a little bit, uh, a little bit of a buffer would allow them to, to actually go, okay, I can, I could do this, but because mm -hmm. they put it in a box and say, Oh, this is bad. You can't even do this. Then you see people just, they're not successful and they drop mm -hmm. out of the programs, which is really my motivation for like wanting to talk to you and, and really kind of cover this, this subject because I do have a lot of friends that struggle with, they have addictive personalities and they just go back and, and they're not able to self actualize because they get mm -hmm. so hung up on the things that are killing them, you know, maybe it's alcohol or drugs versus just saying, okay, well, here's this alternative that won't fuck your whole life up by using it. And it still gives you a little bit of a reward for pushing and working hard. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And the thing about the thing about it is I think it's so demonized, like you'd said, just because it is a controlled substance still. Um, there are still bans on it in certain counties and states. Um, and the reason those are in place is because it's so under-researched. There is yeah. no, there's not enough data collected on the subject of Kratom for them to make any concrete studies or conclusive decisions about it as a substance. I think the DEA was saying that maybe there were 43 deaths total um, where Kratom was present in the system but I think maybe 42 of them, there was like an alternative hard substance. Yeah. You know? I saw the same thing. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was, there was always something else that was in their system with the Kratom. So, and they're trying to blame it on the Kratom. Like, right. Right. Yeah. And then the autopsies come back and there's Kratom in the system. And they're like, Oh, well we don't know. We don't have any research or knowledge of this substance. So let's label it. Let's, let's red flag it. Right. Right. Yeah. But no research is being done. At the same time, you know, in Asian cultures, they use Kratom for decades, you know, hundreds of years as alternative medicine. And yeah, they don't bat an eyelash at it. It just is a way of life. Right. Yeah. They just chill on the leaves over there is what I've yep. heard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, if the FDA can get their, if they can't get their hooks in it, you know, and make money off of it, of course they want to ban it because they sure. make so much money off of Suboxone and Methadone. And I've had friends that have had to detox off of both and, and they're, they are as addictive as heroin. Like they're very sure. hard to get off of. And obviously the government makes a lot of money or, or maybe the government doesn't make a lot of money, but the pharmaceuticals make a lot of money off of those things. Yeah. And I just feel like it's so corrupt, you know? So if, if it's something that's natural and it's not addictive and it doesn't cause you to make mistakes, then I, don't, I just don't see any, any harm in it. But you had mentioned something earlier about it being a, a psycho. What was it? What was the term? Uh, a psycho stimulant is what it's classified as. Yeah. So have you yeah. like researched uh, more mm -hmm. of the scientific side of Kratom? Yeah. So I work mental health. That is my job. So I'm more I, like I'm science based. I want like results and answers and studies. And that's kind of how my mind works. Um, so obviously, when I had encountered this, this plant or this, this leaf, you know, I wanted to know everything about it. I wanted to see all of the studies and I wanted to know how, why is it regulated, you know? So what Kratom does in your system is it bonds to our opioid receptors. Um, no, I've read, I read that it tickles the opioid receptors. It doesn't actually attach, which is why you don't get the, the addiction or the habit. Is that true? Yeah. Well, and again, there's not enough conclusive evidence on, to say either way, but we do know it affects them. Right. Um, and at the same time, I mean, that doesn't really do a whole lot for me because I don't have pain. You know, usually that produces like the analgesic effect, um, but that's not why I use it. I use it for my mood. There are a few studies that, that theorize that maybe it also does the same thing to like serotonin receptors, but there's not enough conclusive evidence on that either. Um, but from my own experience, I can say that that's probably true because of the way that it does just visibly change my demeanor. I mean, I am almost a different person sometimes coming out of a panic attack after I use Kratom. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I was watching a Joe Rogan podcast the other day and he was, he was on it for pain. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of bodybuilders and athletes do use it for pain mm -hmm. because of the fact that it's not addictive where, you know, in the past, maybe they would have got prescribed something like Percocets 
for a, you know, a muscle, a muscle pull or whatever it is. And then a lot of people do fall into addiction through prescribed prescription medication. Sure. So this is just a, a really good alternative. Um, so is there a lot of, a lot of Kratom used in Florida? Cause there's not a lot, it's not very well known where I'm from. I don't want, you know, and I, I talk about it a lot more, the more I learn about it, the more I talk about it. Um, and I feel like regardless of where the person is located that I am talking to, whether it's here or, you know, somewhere far away, the response is either one of two, what's that, right? Or, oh, that's not good for you. That will kill you. Right. And that's really, that's really it. I mean, the Kratom bars and the Kava bars around here, they're pretty I mean, they get pretty popping at points. There are times where I see them very full. There are times where they're empty, you know, so I don't, I don't really know. I know the companies in our area are, are making really great strides in, in getting knowledge out. Um, yeah. But I haven't personally like encountered someone on my own who's been like, oh yeah, I know that stuff. It's great. <laughs> it's just, it's so foreign, it seems. Yeah. 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 I, like I discovered it about two years ago and, and I had, no idea of it before. Have you ever used kava actually? I do. I, I do use kava occasionally. Yeah. And that's more if I'm looking to like relax because yeah. you know, you know, there are different, the veins of Kratom are different. There's the white, the red and the green generally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the kava bar that I was talking about, they like to do Kratom kava cocktails. Like they'll do like a sleepy time cocktail that I really like. It's a red mm -hmm. vein Kratom with a shot of kava and I love it. And it really knocks me out. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. We have to get that in Baltimore. Actually, it's kind of part of my, my vision for my life is I want to open a place that has that alcohol and drug alternatives like that to help people yeah. get sober. Cause I feel like, you know, you gotta have, you gotta have some alternative. You can't tell people to do nothing, you know? Right. Yeah. And there like, are a few of them opening up around here. It's becoming kind of, it's coming like <clears throat> in, in little pins popular, like in certain areas, you can tell that it's gaining speed because we had one big kava bar and they advertised a social, like a social environment without the, the alcohol, essentially that was their catch. Right. And then I noticed another place come up like that. Um, and I think we have three in the area now uh, that I know of. There's a lot of sober people down in uh, South Florida. <laughs> I don't yeah. really know. I, mean, I, 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 I know a lot. Of, uh, I know. A lot, yeah. I know. I know a few myself that live in yeah. the Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale area that have yeah. moved down there from you know the northeast or whatever. And so I think there's a lot of a lot of need for something like that down there. Sure. Yeah. That's never been my world, so I never. I never. I don't really know about you know that end of it. But I know that that the education is out there and it's kind of picking up a little bit of speed in our area. That's awesome. Good. I'm glad to hear it. So tell everybody where they can find you. So I am only exclusively on Instagram. Um, Steffi and Sage uh, is my name. Don't ask me how I got it, but that's where I landed. Um, and I talk a lot about, I talk a lot about alternative medicines um, and mental health. Uh, I'm vegan. So I do talk a lot. I do a little bit of activism on my page there. Um, and I'm just very transparent about things of, of, those nature that, that I'm very passionate about. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love the outside the box stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'll just bring a little bit of uh, authenticity to such a, it feels just like such a vapid world, like such a superficial world. And my goal is to essentially just inject some real authenticity into it. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. Thanks for giving us some time. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. All right. I'll see you later. Chloe B is an herbalist. And uh, first off, just thanks for taking time to join us. Where Absolutely. are you coming in from? Where, where are you at right now? So I actually moved to Honolulu in July. And I am at UH Manoa, University of Hawaii at Manoa, doing a grad program in um, an MFA in dance and choreography. Tough life. It's beautiful. Yeah. I, so I, I've been managing and um, owning an herbal apothecary for eight years and I have always been a dancer and it was just time for me to um, get back into the art side of my life while integrating herbal medicine, of course, in that, like after 
you know, years of Meridian therapy and traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. So, wow. I'm so interested to talk to you. <laughs> so I'm, I have a, you know, an interest, I wouldn't say it's, it's as extensive as yours is, but I've had an interest in, in herbs and tinctures and alternative supplements for a long time. So I, I got sober personally about nine years ago and I was completely cold turkey for about six and a half. And then I discovered kava and kratom. And mm. it was like heaven to me because I just white knuckled the shit out of it for so long. You know, when stress would hit or depression, I, I just knew I couldn't go back to drinking uh, because it wasn't good for me. And so for me, kava and kratom have been really beneficial. And I feel like a lot of people when they, you know, maybe struggling, they don't even know about these things that they're out there and they return to things that aren't so good for them. So how did you get into apothecary and then tell people what that even is? Sure. An apothecary is, it's basically nature's pharmacy in a way. So when you, when you walk into the herb store, you initially are greeted by a smiling herbalist because herbalists are generally super happy and stoked, enthusiastic and wildly wacky and goofy people. Cause, um, people who are herbalists usually come from a long lineage of, um, you know, druids and witches and healers and all of that. So we're, we're pretty happy because we love earth medicine and earth medicine keeps us well. And, and we're not really um, weighed down by the intensity of the world because we have plant allies. So anyways, you walk in and there's always a, a very real authentic smiling person there. And then behind them is jars and jars and herbs of, of herbs of, on the wall. So, um, big jars, small jars, um, powders, capsules, leaves, roots, mixed teas, single herbs, resins, incenses, um, things for making decoctions and teas. And then also things for natural smoking blends, we have a whole section that's specifically for helping people get off of nicotine. So things that they can roll up themselves with less and less tobacco to kind of wean themselves off of smoking tobacco. Our biggest section, well, we have a, a, a lot of popular sections of chais and women's herbs and superfoods and things like that. But what people ask us for the most is things to increase libido and sexual stamina and also things for sleep support, anxiety support, cognition and nervous system regeneration and maintenance. So we have a big extensive wall and section for nootropics or cognition enhancing botanicals, which sometimes are also things that benefit the nervous system and thus the sex drive as well. So we kind of dress a lot of different limbs of the human body and the human consciousness through botanical medicine. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, how I kind of got interested in it was when I when I got sober, you know, I I still wanted to go have fun. I would go to bars and really my only choices were like, okay, you could have a Diet Coke or you could have a Red Bull. And that was about it. Mm-hmm. I thought to myself, man, I, I knew about these herbs, some of these like valerian root and uh, kava and and I didn't know about Kratom at the time, but I knew about Garana and Mahuang and some of these things. And I thought, you know, if if there was some type of non-alcoholic drink that, you know, made with tinctures that wouldn't make me drunk, but I could walk up to a bar and go through the whole uh, ritual of of thinking about what I wanted and actually be able to order a drink and be able to sip on it and, and think, well, this actually might relax me a little bit. Like, man, that would be, that would be so good. But when you don't have that, it's like, you don't even want to go to the bar because it's like, there's nothing even there for you. So then you miss out on that whole social piece. Right. Yeah. And it's like, and what you really need when you're trying to get out of those things is community. You need people. And then, and then what you see is you see people isolate because they don't want to go to the bars and then they end up getting someone pregnant or they end up using or drinking again anyway, because that takes its toll because we were built for relationships. Mm. We so, are such social creatures. And from the beginning of time, there has been a human fascination with altered states, whether it's, you know, the indigenous Maya or high mountains in China or Tibetan philosophy or Egyptian or um, 
you know, indigenous North American peoples, there has always been a practice around rites of passage and a practice around plant medicine for more lucid states in the dream realm. And also like exactly what you're saying as a social lubricant and as a camaraderie tool. So yeah. absolutely, we are, we are social beings who have always befriended and respected and communicated with plant medicines. So I'm, I'm super grateful you asked um, me about this because anthropology, ethnobotany, and uh, communication are all definitely in this umbrella of, of, of plant medicine. And, and, and Kratom too, what an amazing discovery that you've made because so many people are, are yet to discover it. Not that I promote a, a big sweeping trend because trends are dangerous. You know, trends can support scarcity um, in the places where plants come from, but it's, it's respectful cultivation, importation, and orientation around these plant medicines that can create sustainability and regeneration of the practices around plants like kava and kratom. Because they're such groovy tools. I mean, I feel you when I go out for a night of drinking or like I, I used to drink more probably in like my very early 20s and I could hang with it. I could handle it. And then now like I just turned 30 and sure, I love like a really cool elixir, like a divine cocktail with like some botanically crafted bitters, some like soda water, some elderflower champagne. Like I love ferments, you know, ferments and bitters are special. But at the same time, if you're like drinking just to drink and get drunk the next day, like oh, I cannot hang. I'm just, I don't know if it's age or just like maturity or, or, um, or what, but I just try to stay hydrated. And even then alcohol just takes a toll on me the next day. And as a performing artist, you have to be in a state of inspiration and vitality to create work and to hold conversation and to have intellectual connection. So when I discovered, um, kava, I started making kava brownies as an alternative to edibles because cannabis too is an amazing medicine, but really potent. And if you just need a little relaxation to take the edge off or a little sleep support, kava is like such a great alternative that it's not going to yeah. intoxicate you per se, but more so just alter your alter your of state of being and just be like a wave of relaxation and tension relief and giggly euphoria and um, yeah, it's a cool tool. And uh, when did, tell me, when, how did you discover and, and how long ago was that? Yeah, I just heard some people talking about it in the area and raving about it. And it got my interest and I did some research and I, I ended up, I'm actually drinking some right now. I, I just put it in, in my tea and I've been drinking it fairly regularly for about two years with no real downside. I don't have any kind of hangover. There's no addict associated with it. I could have it one day and the next day I, I could have it or not have it. It's no big deal. Um, but sometimes it just really, like you said, it, it, it helps me take the edge off. I noted that you actually spoke on the uses of, uh, Kratom for people as an alternative to opioids. Right. And was it at a university? Is that right? That was at the, um, Southwest, <clears throat> the Southwest college of naturopathic medicine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really want to hear about that because I have friends that uh, struggle with heroin addiction. You know, I see people that messed our whole life up. So if we just look at the problem, at some point we have to realize, okay, this doesn't work anymore. Like cold tur turkey does work for some people, but for the majority of people, it doesn't work for. Because there's people that are homeless. They just don't want to get sober that bad that they'll, they literally will live outside. You know, make this thing well, more well known, more readily accessible and, and help people get to a place where they can take care of themselves and provide just basic necessities of life. I'd love to hear your take on that. Sure. Sure. Let me dive into some history just to provide some background on this precious, precious little tree. So it's a jungle loving tree. It loves to live in sub equatorial jungles that are like lowland, um, moisture loving. It's native to Myanmar, Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, Indonesia and Thailand and it's been found in the pharmacies in Thailand the traditional pharmacies which are also apothecaries um, since the early 1900s with specific listing to relieve pain and to relieve fatigue and um, fatigue is something that we all share as human beings whether it's fatigue from the use of a screen or fatigue from labor work in the fields or fatigue you know, from caretaking for children it's it's a human phenomenon that is shared and is common ground for 
for us. Um, so uh, Mitragyna speciosa is the name of Kratom. That's the Latin name. And it's, in the member, it's a member of the Rubiaceae family, which is also where coffee and gardenia come from, two other tropical, gorgeous, aromatic, wonderful plants. Um, throughout Asia, the leaves have been chewed to stave off exhaustion while working in the fields, especially with rubber trees um, during the big rubber um, industry increase that was used a lot for um, maintaining resilience while working with the rubber. And uh, it's also, you can use it an analgesically, which it means pain relief wise for um, wounds as a fresh crushed leaf on your wounds. And that's another way that it's, that it's used. And wow, um, yeah, and then in Thailand, it's cool that the tradition goes beyond just consuming it. They actually greet people in some cultures. Um, they greet them at the door with, with a fresh crushed kratom leaf. And together, they'll chew this kratom leaf as a form of ancestral uh, worship. And um, it's also used for labor pain, for increasing sexual appetite, and, and good, it's good for intestinal pain. What I'm learning a lot right now is its respiratory effect because of the COVID-19 um, situation we're in right now. Kratom is kind of drying. From a Chinese medicine perspective, it has this like kind of drying effect on lung yin, which is like the phlegm, the soft phlegm side of the lungs. Of the, of the, of the lungs. And so it can actually be kind of drying for the, for the lungs if you have a lot of bronchial um, congestion. And so it's great for opening up airways, which also increases athletic performance and stamina because it can just be a bronchial dilator in a way. Um, another interesting fact about it, I don't want to get too geeky, but I get really geeky because I love all the constituents involved. But another cool thing, which I'm sure you know, cause you're drinking it as a tea, it's got that bitter taste. Yeah. 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 Sure yeah so the bitter is like, uh, a wonderful pathway that we do not work out enough here in America on the sad diet, the standard American diet, because of so many lush and fluffy carbohydrates and like salted things, our, our intestines actually become a little bit untoned because we're so used to things that are either sweet or savory or sweet or savory. We don't have a lot of that sour or bitter in our taste spectrum. So the bitterness in Kratom can also kind of open up that vegal, like the vega nerve, which is like on the um, the gut brain axis it's a nerve that's triggered when we have the the bitter taste and that um kind of just promotes gut ecology in a way um increasing our capacity for digestion and the serotonergic system from the gut to the brain and all that stuff so um but yeah blah 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 blah. I, I, so many things i could say about it but huh. getting back to like camaraderie conversation hosting guests it has a lot of like really benevolent traditional uses yeah. um that they truly say and like kapuas hulu my friend says like it's a gift from god it's a gift to god and, and by god they mean like you know um ancestral worship as well as a, a pantheon of deities that that they worship in their traditions and um so with opiate addiction it's so prevalent i'm i am nearly positive that everybody listening in and that everybody who's sat in with a lecture with me before at, whether it was at the naturopathic college or other podcasts or on my blog or in my store people know other people who are having a habit forming pattern with opiates and whether that be fentanyl oxycotton oxycodone hydrocodone um or heroin and and it's really common and it's a uh, it's something that we have to like hold space for and not marginalize in our our human community because i think there is overall a huge stigma around drug use and that stigma does no favors for the addict mentality that stigma further pressure presses them into substance abuse and oppression and isolation and um so this is a medicine that is is legal and you can readily access through apothecaries like mine and tempe and um i don't recommend you know getting it from smoke shops and i've never worked with a lot of extracts that are sold in smoke shops like the extracts i have less trust for because of consistency where i see the most um effective protocols for tapering off of opiates is when people are using fresh um just whole powdered kratom or or leaf or capsules in like a non-extract form tinctures are cool too but when you get like metragynine 140x like that can amplify tolerance and also just kind of be hard for your liver to process so i'm just letting 
you know that my experience in the tapering down protocol comes with um, just the whole, the whole plant and all of its constituents, because I feel like plants are best in their whole form. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so in Thailand, mm -hmm. currently being used for methamphetamine addiction treatment, and also reduce, reducing dependency on foreign morphine imports, which hopefully we can start to do here too, because um, morphinism or, or the addiction to morphine has swept through America for cent, you know for decades, like back 100 years ago when morphine start, first started coming out, people were getting really dope sick off that and it hasn't really stopped. Right. Um, so I was, you know, seeing people, and there's a lot of misinformation out there that they say, you know, Kratom is addictive. And speaking from experience, from someone that's used it fairly regularly for the last two years, I haven't noticed any addiction, any addictive properties. What I've read about it was that it, it tickles your opioid receptors. And so it doesn't actually attach. And I guess that's the difference between something like, you know, a, a, an opioid or fentanyl or whatever, they actually attach. And that's why people get sick because they get a habit. So do you find, have you found it in your, you know, research or anything is there any kind of addiction to it or is it do you maybe you have to do more or, or longer or what what is it or is there just not everyone is different and there is binding that occurs to mitragynine at selected receptor systems in the central nervous system so there are tickling of the mu and the kappa and the delta receptors in the brain and those are things that receive opiates and also receive mitragynine so there are pathways that are i like what you said tickled that's a good way to put it um from from mitragynine which is that active alkaloid in kratom i think what's important for us to look at is the demographics that are using kratom and why they're using kratom so i've been providing it to the community of Tempe and Phoenix for eight years. And I can confidently say that students are using this medicine as a direct replacement to Adderall and to painkillers, yeah. um, elderly people who, or people who have had trauma or, or surgeries um, are, are using it as an alternative for painkillers because they have severe inflammation or body pain. Um, firefighters, TSA agents, construction workers, service-oriented humans in general have a pretty high level of chemical exposure and really like stressful and demanding work. So a lot of them have chronic lower back issues and have been prescribed hydrocodone or Vicodin on a daily basis. And in fact, like over 60 million Americans report chronic pain as a part of their like daily reality. And I've kind of done a lot of research into that. And some of the people who are using, a lot of the people who are using Kratom are coming as a direct substitute from another substance. Yeah. And so in that way, I can't safely say, I can't securely say, oh, it causes zero habit forming side effects because right. there's behavioral habits there as well as any potential like binding that could happen. There's behavioral, totally. if you're switching directly from a pharmaceutical into Kratom, you are then going to depend on the Kratom to provide that comfort because it's really yeah. about, about the comfort. And it's I, less like physically addictive and more psychologically addictive. It's as addictive as coffee, you know, because there is caffeine in it, but I'm, but there's nothing like, like causing physiologically, coffee is, is like eight or nine times more addicting than Kratom. Wow. That's, that's interesting. I know when I stopped drinking coffee, I actually have a caffeine headache for a few days. I know. <laughs> it's, I feel you. I, I try to do like four days on, three days off with coffee. That's my flow because it's such a beautiful plant. Oh my goodness. And you can put so many cool things in it like licorice and anise and chaga. And like I put burdock and dandelion in mine as like a nice liver flush. And like coffee is just a beautiful vehicle for other amazing herbs too. <laughs> you really know your plants. I got to give it to you. <laughs> well yeah so just back on that like another thing that i haven't really said too much is is alcohol like what you're saying so um so as like a social lubricant all opiates aside there's a lot of um i've noticed this trend too it's beautiful there's a lot of dads who have a wonderful nine to five job and they come home and they relax with a six pack or a whole bottle of wine on a daily basis like that's a habit that has formed maybe over five years of that certain job or over 10 years of that job or 10 years of that family structure or jack and, and coke or whatever yeah yeah or jack and coke or anything and i could probably literally name like 20 to 25 um, regular clients who come in to get Kratom who have literally said to us again and again, this saved my marriage. 
Like, look how much weight I've lost. Not because it's not increasing your appetite, but because of the caloric intake of alcohol and sugar. Absolutely. And um, like to take the edge off and to be able to decompress with something that isn't full of sugar and liver depressing alcohol is pretty phenomenal. Because if you look at alcohol, it's technically a depressant. So it's going to have these downstream consequences of fatigue, sluggishness, potentially long-term lowered self-esteem, um, just decreased metabolism in general, um, decreased motivation. So in that way, if you start to switch to Kratom and then you realize an increase in motivation and a better sense of metabolism, perhaps you are forming a positive habit with, with Kratom and and, you know, for case by case basis, I think it's okay to an- analyze that on a case by case basis. Cause I don't want to make any general or broad claims, you know, I'm sure you there could is- actually alcohol is the one thing that you could actually die from quitting. There is a major downside to that, you know? So yeah, there's yeah. always, there's that. But the thing, I think what the way it is for alcohol is they were just around first, you know, like it's, it's the socially acceptable Mm -hmm. Uh, drug of choice. So if you were to come home, like you said, and have a Jack and Coke every night for 10 years, no one would look, no one would think that that was not normal. Mm -hmm. Even though so many people die off of alcohol, you know, every year. And and the only deaths that are attributed to Kratom, from what I've learned, there was always something else in the person's system. Exactly. That's very, very, very true. And the American Kratom Association has a wealth and a plethora of amazing information around debunking and demystifying those death claims because, I mean, honestly, at this point, more people die from sharks than Kratom annually. Like it's, yeah, I mean, which is really rare. I mean, shark bites are super rare, but I can confidently say that that less people die from Kratom every year than from ibuprofen. And that's for sure. Wow. And that's like a super benign, super well-trusted, well-known, you know, medicine, but that can directly lead to stomach ulcers. Like no doubt about it, especially if you're having ibuprofen with a Jack and Coke or ibuprofen with, you know, fried foods and your stomach's already taxed out, you know? So yeah. another um, interesting point I just thought of is um, another really kind of more like in the so I do a lot of work around like subtle plant energies too like I love the ingestion of plant medicine and the prescription of formulas for clients I see clients on a regular basis with detox protocols or anyway I have a lot of clients that work with endometriosis or chronic back pain um, low kidney chi or liver chi stagnation I come at it from a traditional Chinese medicine approach but then in my formulations I use a lot of western herbology and um, different kinds of formulations but something that I've seen with many clients over time is that this medicine seems to be a really interesting gateway into a different form of self-care and perhaps even like self-actualization like when the liver is ceases to be depressed by painkillers or by alcohol there seems to be this like positive kind of resurgence of the underlying issue of why the pain is there perhaps it was deep-seated trauma or like later on in sessions people come up and be like you know i think that there's i think that paranoia was underneath my anxiety or like they kind of start to connect to the more like metaphysical energetic or spiritual body through taking away those layers of liver depressants, especially in the apothecary people who open the door into plant medicines with switching or trying Kratom. They'll come in a couple months later and they're like, so I think I'm feeling like I want to clean my house with some smudge or some sage, or I think I want to do like a tea for like a mood booster or like, what do you have for libido? They start to kind of form this trust around plant medicine because it's working so well for them. Right. And then all of a sudden they're having better energy in their home, better sex in their home, better diets, better superfoods, better nutrient profiles. Like, I mean, no huge, like hurrah claims here, but just, it's a pattern that's super consistent is just better self care through not having the liver always in this taxed out state of depression. Yeah. And it's natural, you know? Yeah. Which is great. And it's so much, uh, it's, it's actually so much less expensive than if you were to go out and get on like an antidepressant or, you know, Xanax or whatever, whatever your thing is using something like a cob or a kratom, which I'm big big fans of both. But anyway, I, I really appreciate you have having you on. Uh, you taking the time to come on and educate everybody. Tell the listeners where they can find you. 
Sure. I have an herbal apothecary in Tempe, Arizona called Happy Healthy High Horny Herbs. And then my online platform is a blog and a bunch of medicines that we make from scratch. Me and my partners in my laboratory, we use Sonoran Desert Plants, organic uh, Western herbs, organic Chinese herbs, and that's called Rainbow Bliss Botanicals. Uh, my Instagram is at Rainbow Bliss Botanicals, and then my website is www.rbbotanicals.com, and I'm Chloe B. So I'm super grateful to share any information, and thanks for letting me blabber about some science. And- yeah, it's awesome. It's been great. Everybody go follow her on Instagram. I'll put all the links in the show notes too. But yeah. thanks again, Chloe. This has been great. No problem. Have a good one. All right. You too. Thanks. Be well.